Okay, so time is up. So welcome to the first session, uh, one of the first federal sessions of CAP 2020. My name is Laura Kovac and I'm going to chair this session. Just as a general setup, so we are going to monitor questions uh, to the talk on Slack. So please uh, post your questions on the Slack uh, thread of the talk. Talks will be played, uh, they are pre-recorded and will be played uninterrupted. And then we are going to, uh, I'm going to ask the questions and the uh, speakers are going to answer. So the first uh, speaker is Merkan uh, Temel, PhD student from University of Texas, and he's going to present his joint work with Anna Slobodova and uh, Varent Hunt. And please, the recording can start. Hi, my name is Merkan Temel. I am a PhD student at UT Austin. I will present our paper titled Automated and Scalable Verification of Integer Multipliers. My co-authors are Anna Slobodova, my supervisor from Centaur Technology, and Warren Hunt, my PhD advisor. Algorithms such as booth encoding and Wallace tree are used to create efficient multipliers for hardware. Even though these algorithms have a long history, verification of multipliers has been an ongoing challenge. SAS solvers and BDDs are full automatic, but they do not scale for complex multipliers. Equivalence checkers are used for some industrial designs, but with a lot of manual effort, and this approach is very design specific. Computer algebra methods have shown much better results, but they will present certain challenges and limitations. We propose a different approach. Our method is more efficient and more widely applicable. We have tested it for over 75 different benchmarks with very successful results. It scales much better than the other state-of-the-art tools and we can verify various 1024 by 1024 bit multipliers in less than 10 minutes. We implemented and verified our method on the theorem proving system ACL2. This gives a soundness guarantee to our proofs. Our targeted multipliers are RTL level hierarchical designs. In this presentation, I will first review the integer multipliers and common algorithms to, to design them. Then I will describe our method in detail. Finally, I will show our experiment results comparing the performance of our method to the other state-of-the-art tools. The goal of integer multipliers is to efficiently multiply two-bit vectors for hardware application. We can divide these modules into two parts, partial product generation and summation. Algorithms such as booth encoding are used to generate partial products. And algorithms such as Wall Street sum these partial products. On this figure here, you see an example of a Wall Street multiplier that multiplies two three bit sign numbers A and B. These numbers are sign extended by repeating the most significant bits. Then partial products are created by multiplying each bit with each other, like great school multiplication. Each of these dotted lines are partial pro products. In hardware, these partial products cannot be summed in a single step. Therefore, Wall Street algorithm is used for parallel additions. Groups of bits are selected from these partial products and inputted to half and full adders. The result of these bit level additions are inputted to another set of adders. And this is repeated until we have two rows. Then we use a vector adder, also called a final stage adder, to finish the summations. These algorithms may create very complicated stru structures for verification systems. For example, if we swap some bits on the same column between half and full adders, then we will get a functional thing, but structurally very different designs. So it is important to develop an automated system that has minimum assumptions about the structure and can work with a wide range of multipliers. We aim to verify that multiplier designs are functionally correct. We do that by proving a conjecture of this form in ACL2. ACL2 is an automated and interactive theorem proving system with over 25 years of history and wide industrial use. On the left-hand side of the equality, 
we see the evaluation of the design in SVL format. format. This is translated from system analog so that designs can be interpreted in SEL2. SEL run function evaluates this design for any bit vectors A and B. On the right hand side, we see the specification represented with the built in multiplication function with appropriate sign extension and truncations. The length of the vector A is M, and the length of vector B is N. We prove these conjectures for constant M and N values. This conjecture is submitted to ECL2 using a death sum event, as you can see here. Death sum stands for defined theorem, and it is the common way to prove theorems in ACL2. This executes our verified tools, implementing our rewriting algorithm to simplify and prove multiplier designs correct. We have two main steps to prove such conjectures. The first step pertains to the other modules only. Before reasoning about the multiplier modules, we deal with modules such as full adders and final stage adders that are used by the summation tree algorithms. Then we start working on this conjecture about the multiplier module as given here. Our candidate, candidate designs retain circuit hierarchy, and we take advantage of that. In our system, if a submodule is already proved to be equivalent to its specification, then we can replace its instantiations. So we rewrite the instantiations of all other modules reasoned in step one. Then using two sets of rules that work together, we simplify summation tree and partial product generation algorithms. After rewriting the circuit description, we rewrite the right-hand side to the same form and conclude our proofs. We develop the heuristic that we have observed to work with various multipliers. And this is what I'm going to describe here. Let's go over these steps in, in more detail. Our first step is proving other modules equivalent to their specification. We do that by stating a similar conjecture for others. Here, we choose a specification for each other module that is represented by our functions S, C, and plus. S stands for some bit, and it is an alias for mod2. C stands for carry, and it is equivalent to floor of the y by two. This table gives examples of these specs for some common adders. A half adder has two inputs and two outputs, and its sum and carry bits can be represented this way. The same goes for full adders, which have three inputs instead. Vector adders or final stage adders also have a fixed specification for each output bit as seen here for the first four bits. A multiplier might have different adder components, but coming up with these specifications are often trivial. We prove such conjectures about adders with a set of rewrite rules. This method is described in our paper, and we omit the details here in order to save time, and we focus on multiplier proofs instead. When such death thumb events succeed, they are saved as rewrite rules. So whenever we run into a CL runoff and adder module while rewriting the multiplier modules later, we can replace that instance with the specification of the adder module. After the adder modules, we can now start verifying the multiplier module itself. This is the conjecture that I have shown earlier. Our goal is to rewrite the both sides of the equality into the same final form and conclude our proofs with a simple syntactic check. An example of this final form for each output bit is given on this table. The least significant output bit, out zero, is the summation of the first column of partial products, which has only one bit, A0, B0. The second output bit, out one, is mod two of the summation of the second column, A1, B0 plus A0, B1, plus the carry from the first column and so on for the other output bits. A mathematical definition of this form is given in the paper. We prove this to be equivalent to the built-in ACL2 multiplication function. So whenever we see the multiplication of two-bit vector, two vectors as seen on this conjecture, we replace them with this form. So now let's go over our rewriting algorithm that can convert various multiplier designs into our final form. First, Let's assume that we have a Wall Street multiplier with simple partial products. After rewriting the other modules with their specification from step one, we may get this term at the top for a multiplier output bit. 
Our goal is to simplify this term and convert it into our final form. We observe that such terms have many nested calls of the function s. We can get rid of such nested calls with this lemma. Basically, the arguments of the inner calls of s can be extracted. After applying this lemma, we get the simplified term at the bottom. This term still doesn't look like the final form, and we see the summation of these. Since our final form does not contain such instances, our intuition tells us that we should try to remove these somehow. We introduce a new function d, which is equivalent to divided by 2. Remember that c is equivalent to floor of divided by 2. c and d can be rewritten in terms of each other as seen in the last lemma. So whenever we see a summation of two or more c's, we convert them to d, and we add them together. And we do that for all other summations, c plus d and d plus d as well. Then we convert a single instance of d back to c whenever possible with the last lemma. When these lemmas are applied to the term at the top, we get the term at the bottom. This matches our targeted final form, so we can conclude that the multiplier is correct for this output bit. It may not be evident by this example, but this method works for very large multipliers as well. Rewriting with these lemmas and some additional rules about commutativity and associativity of addition, we have simplified and verified 1024 by 1024 bit multipliers as you will see in our experiment. Even though I have shown as if these lemmas are applied one after the other, they're actually applied in an indeterminate order. Rewriting is done from inside out, and we apply any one of these lemmas when they are applicable to the term, so we don't have to traverse large terms over and over again. The lemmas shown so far are only sufficient when the multiplier uses simple partial products. Some partial product generation algorithms, such as booth encoding, may create much more complicated terms. An example of such a term after all other simplification took place is given at the top. It is much dirtier than our final form. Our first step is to get rid of old extraneous logical operators, such as XOR, OR, and NOT, with these three lemmas. Then we obtain a term at the top that is composed of only S, C, plus, minus, and logical AND functions. Again, we try to convert such, convert such terms into our final form. The first three lemmas pertain to subtracted arguments. Whenever we encounter such an instance, we drop the sign for S, C, and D functions, and we add that instance to the term itself for C and D functions. The last three lemmas pertain to repeated arguments. For S, the duplicates simply cancel each other. For C and D, the duplicates are removed from the arguments and a duplicated element is added to the term. After applying these lemmas, we get a term at the top, and we get the term at the bottom. This matches our final form for the second output bit of a multiplier. And this concludes our methodology. All the lemmas for multiplier module proofs given in step two work together, and we do not require any user guidance about what algorithm is used in the design. Now let's see the, let's see the performance of this method by checking our experiments. We have tested our method for over 75 different benchmarks. These include multipliers with sign or unsigned of simple partial products and booth encoding. Summation tree algorithms such as array, wall of tree, data tree, 42 compressors, and overturned state trees, and so on. And a final stage adders such as breadcomb and Leonard Fisher. The complete list is given in our paper. Not only do we show the wide applicability of our approach, but we also show that our method is very fast. For that, we measure the total time to verify all the modules in a multiplier design, including proofs for each other module, and a final proof for the multiplier module. We compare our method to the other state-of-the-art tools. These two are computer algebra-based methods that appeared in DAC 2019 and FMCAT 2019, respectively. The first one only works with unsigned multipliers, and they do not produce certificates, so there is no way to check the correctness of their proofs. The second one demonstrated a great improvement over the previous studies in terms of both the performance and the ability to produce certificates. Since our method is verified, we also included the time to verify those certificates for their tools. 
Here we give the average timing results for each multiplication size from 64 by 64 to 1024 by 1024 bit multiplication. The other tools could not verify some of the benchmarks, either due to some program error or timeout. So we also show the success rate on separate columns for each tool. The other columns show the average timing result in seconds for the benchmarks that the tools could prove. As you can see, our, tools, our tool is orders of magnitude faster than the other tools, could verify all the designs, and has a much better scaling factor. Kaufman's tool could run most of the benchmarks, but started to time out for some booth encoded designs after 256 by 256 bit multipliers. That is why it looks like they are getting faster for 512 by 512 bit multipliers. Their averages, their, their averages just do not involve the slow multipliers at that point. In order to make a better one-to-one -one comparison with Kaufman's tool, we implemented the eight benchmarks that they could run for all the sizes and calculated, calculated the averages for those benchmarks only. This is given at the bottom. Our tool already is faster by a factor of six for small designs, but it scales very well. And for 1,000 by 1,000 bit multipliers, we see that our tool is 40 times faster on average than the fastest tool available. We can find the results for individual benchmarks in our paper. The complete table will show that our tool is more consistent and gives more similar results for all the multiplier types, whereas the other tools give more fluctuating results for some benchmarks with different algorithms. In conclusion, we have proposed an efficient method for the verification problem of integer multipliers. We have not proved the completeness of our method, but we have shown that it, is, it can work with a wide range of multipliers that implement algorithms used in the industry. And very importantly, our tool is verified using the theorem proving system ACL2. Getting these results required overcoming many technical difficulties and keeping the program verified while maintaining optimum performance was the biggest challenge. In the end, we are glad to have a publicly available tool that can reliably verify these complex designs. As per the future work, we would like to generate counterexamples in case of a bugger design to help guide the users find the bug, and we'd like to support completely flattened designs. Thank you all for listening. Thank you as well for your talk. And now if you have questions, please post them on the Slack thread of the paper. There is already one talk, so I'm going to read it and then uh, that can, can, you can answer. So the question is whether the read-write rules are lemmas, which are the lemmas, are they confluent? Or actually, how do you find the correct order of rewriting rule applications? Okay, so these rewrite rules do not subsume each other, so we can apply them in any order. Uh, so as we rewrite from inside out, we just select any one of these rules and just apply them. In implementation, they have an order, but the order actually doesn't matter. Yeah. Actually, and until the next question, so I was uh, the same question, like, but how do you orient the, the rewrite rules? So how do you make sure that the left-hand side is in the left-hand side? that is going, it's about the confluence and it's going to be written by the right hand side and you don't get into circular definitions. Sure, so this is mostly maintained by the, um, this is mostly uh, content, like maintained by the rewrite itself. So as we read, so we don't have, we don't have to do multiple passes on the same term. Uh, as it starts rewriting, it just goes to the innermost term. Uh, and these rewrite rules, when they're implemented, they actually have a priority in the system. Uh, so it just selects the most recent one, tries to apply it. If it doesn't apply, it tries the previous one, and so on and so on. And apply these rewrite rules uh, until there's nothing changes, basically, in the current inside most term. Uh, so in the system, they have a priority with respect to each other. But what I'm saying is they don't have to have this priority. And if I implement it in a different way, put them in a different order, they will still work the same way. Does that answer? Yeah, thank you.
So we've seen no further question on the Slack and time is also pretty much up. So thank you again for the presentation. Thank you so much, yeah. And then we can move to the next talk given by Lenny Truong, who is a PhD student at Stanford University and he's going to present his, uh, or their tool uh, called FOLT. So it's a tool paper presentation, but it's a shorter presentation. So please, the recording can start. Hello, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. In this talk, I'll be presenting our tools paper titled FOLT, a Python embedded domain specific language for metaprogramming portable hardware verification components. In 2019, Hennessy and Patterson won a Turing Award and declared that we are entering a new golden age for computer architecture. They noted that the good news for architects is that modern electronic computer-aided design tools raise the level of abstraction, and this higher level of abstraction increases reuse across designs. One specific way that architects increase reuse across designs is based on the concept of a hardware generator. A generator is a program that produces variants of a circuit based on a set of input parameters. For example, consider a processor generator that allows the user to choose their desired bus interface protocol. The same processor generator can be easily integrated into different chips using different protocols. More generally, this concept of capturing multiple variants of a circuit in a single generator allows the construction of design components that can be reused in more contexts with less effort. Modern generators are defined using hardware construction languages such as Magma or Chisel. These are domain specific languages that embed the capabilities to describe circuits into a software programming language. Designers implement generators by using the host language to metaprogram the hardware construction language. In this example, we have a Python function that accepts a parameter n for the desired width of a counter and constructs a counter circuit by executing a Magma program defined in terms of n. So let's ask an important question. How do hardware construction languages affect verification effort? It turns out in practice, they increase the required effort. A team at Google used Chisel to construct the Edge TPU and found that when using a hardware construction language, the design productivity gains were offset by losses in design verification. This made verification, which is already the long pole of the chip design process, even longer. What are the challenges faced when verifying hardware construction language generators? First, traditional methods verify the compiler generated code instead of the hardware construction language source code. This means verification engineers are working on a representation of the design that has lost some of the important high level information captured in the original generator. Also, the target language of the compiler, which is usually system Verilog, lacks many of the powerful capabilities of the hardware construction language environment making it a challenge for the verification engineers to match the productivity of the designers. Second, sophisticated generators can produce hardware with varying interfaces and internal behaviors. This means that per design component, there is a larger space of functionality to cover, which in turn means the scope of the verification task has grown. Both these challenges place a demand on our community to develop tools to increase the productivity in the process of verifying hardware generators. Towards this goal of improving productivity, we have developed Fault, a Python embedded hardware verification language. Fault is integrated with a hardware construction language, Magma, which allows verification to be done at the same level of abstraction as design code. Fault supports metaprogramming so that verification components can be as flexible as their design counterparts. Finally, Fault is designed for portability, which increases verification productivity by allowing users to easily migrate between verification tools to find the best one for the task at hand. Here's a simple Fault example. On the left, we have a Magma circuit for a 16-bit adder. The interface contains two 16-bit inputs and one 16-bit output. The logic simply computes the output as the addition of the inputs. On the right, we have a corresponding Fault test where we set the input values to be three and two, evaluate the circuit, and check that the output is five. Let's extend the previous example to showcase some basic metaprogramming. From the circuit on the left, rather than hard code the addition operation, we can generalize the circuit by defining a function that accepts an operation as a parameter and performs the operation to construct the logic to compute the output value. For the test on the right, we can similarly use the operation as a parameter to generate the desired circuit under test and to compute the expected output value. Fault uses an architecture where execution is performed in two stages. 
In the first stage, a Python program is executed to construct a fault program. In the second stage, the fault program is compiled and run in a target environment. As you can see, fault supports a wide variety of backend target languages and runtimes, ranging from open source and commercial simulators, as well as a formal model checker. Fault staged architecture is designed for portability, which is an essential quality of the tool. Productive designers will integrate components from libraries. These libraries should ship with both design and verification components. And to be useful in practice, these distributed verification components must be compatible with a wide variety of tools. Portability also promotes diversity and innovation in the tooling ecosystem. By adding a fault backend, a new tool can enable users to easily migrate to their new technology without having to develop brand new verification components. Finally, portability enables new verification methodologies by allowing users to easily migrate between tools based on their requirements. Here's one example of how portability allows users to find the best tool for the task at hand. In this experiment, we use the unit test suite for a CGRA processing element, which is a design component similar to an ALU that you can find in a traditional processor. Each unit test generates a new test bench for an operation and an input-output pair. This stresses the simulator's ability to handle incremental changes. We found that one simulator was drastically slower than the other two simulators. But since fault tests can be easily switched between simulators, users can choose the fastest one available for this specific task. However, more importantly, this process can be repeated for other tasks as the fastest simulator may change. In conclusion, to enable a new golden age for computer architecture, the verification community must develop tools powerful enough to match the capabilities of hardware construction language generators. Towards this goal, we developed Fault, a Python embedded language for metaprogramming portable hardware verification components. Fault is being used in academia and industry to develop both research and production chips. You can find the code on GitHub and we'd love for you to come join our community. Thanks. Thank you as well from, uh, for a nice talk and presentation. So I'm monitoring the questions. Um, your, there, are no, there are no questions yet. So maybe until the, next, until the questions are right, let me ask one question. So how much effort, uh, how can, did you quantify the human effort that it was needed to write your testers or the FOIL testers that you also, is there any support on FOIL or you just assume that you have a library of tests? Um, yeah, so we, we did one experiment to quantify this. Um, basically, uh, in, in another case study we did, we, we experimented with using fault to do a mixed signal test. Um, so in a mixed signal design, there's both analog and digital components. And when you're verifying a mixed signal circuit, um, you have a choice as to whether you want to, you know, simulate at a higher level of abstractions. You might simulate at the logic or digital level, and you might abstract the analog components and represent them as, you know, some function or some, you know, uh, software model. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum, you might instead do a spice simulation. So you might simulate it at a very low level and actually, you know, use things like transistors and physics. Um, and so for fault, what we did was we allowed you to write a single test bench and basically, you know, you could do a quick prototype in, you know, a higher level RTL simulation. And then when, when you're, fairly confident that it was correct, you could easily switch to SPICE just to make sure it worked at the lower level or the higher resolution simulation. And in this case, the fault test bench was, um, I think, three to four times smaller in terms of code compared to, you know, the old way you would do this is you, you'd have a separate test bench for your higher level simulation, then you have to write a separate SPICE test bench for your low level simulation. Um, so in that, you know, in, in those cases where you might want to switch simulators and the simulators have different sort of source inputs, you can save a lot of code by using this um, tool. Cool, thank you. There are no questions arriving yet on Slack. Seems everyone uh, was convinced that the tool is really usable and nice. So <laughs> that's thank great. Thank you for convincing people. So I guess. Then it concludes your talk and your presentation. Thank you again for your uh, for your talk, and then we can move in this talk. Sorry. So the next uh, 
talk. It's a regular paper, regular uh, presentation on um, regular paper accepted at CAF. The talk is given by Friedrich Slizowski, who's a postdoctoral researcher at the Technical University of Vienna. And the talk is about interpolation based semantic gate extraction and its application to QBS. So I would say that let's just wait a few more seconds that we are in time with respect to now shadow and then we can start the talk. And that just started. I'm going to present a new gate extraction, definition extraction technique, and an application of this technique to pre-processing quantified Boolean formulas. So there are two parts here. In the first part, I'm going to present a new definition extraction technique for propositional logic, where we want to answer queries of the following kind. Given a propositional formula phi, a variable y, and a set x of variables, is y defined by x? We will show that this can be reduced to calling a SAT solver, which will then either conclude that y is not defined in terms of x, or return a definition of y in terms of x. So that's the first part. And in the second part, I'll talk about applications of this technique, specifically in pre-processing quantified Boolean formulas. In the paper, there's also a, a short section on dependency QBF. And I think, and that's not in the paper, this could also be very useful in Boolean synthesis. So first of all, what do we mean by a definition in propositional logic? We say that a variable y is defined by a set of variables x in a propositional formula phi if in any satisfying assignment sigma of phi, the assignment of x uniquely determines the assignment of y. So formally, if we have two satisfying assignments of phi that agree on x, that assign each variable in x the same value, then they also assign y the same value. And we know that in propositional logic, this is the case if and only if there is a propositional formula psi on variables x such that any model of, of phi assigns y and psi the same truth value. And this formula is what we call a definition. So how do we detect that a variable is defined in a formula? There is a standard technique that is specifically tailored to detecting definitions introduced by converting a circuit into conjunctive normal form. So for instance, in this CNF formula, we may be able to see that these three clauses here define x1 as the conjunction of x and not y, while these three clauses define x2 as a disjunction of v and not w. There are very efficient algorithms that find all occurrences of such patterns in a CNF formula and then can reconstruct the original circuit from these gate definitions. This is what I want to call syntactic gate detection. And these algorithms are very efficient, but they are inherently limited to a predefined library of gates. One of the main motivations for this work was a semantic definability check that relies on a result known as Padua's theorem, which states that definability can be checked by a Cohen-P oracle. And more specifically, a variable y is defined by a set x of variables if and only if this formula is unsatisfiable. Now, what does this formula say? If you look at this, this just is the formula itself and y. And here we have a copy of the formula where all the variables except x are renamed and then not y prime. So what this says here is, is there a satisfying assignment where y is set to true? And another satisfying assignment that agrees on x where y 
is set to false. So that is exactly the definition of definability. Now, for the purposes of model counting, it is enough to know that a variable is defined. It is not necessary to extract the corresponding definition. So the authors of that paper stopped there. But I was wondering, can we extract the definition somehow from the proof of unsatisfiability? And after thinking about this for a while, I realized that the answer is really rather simple and it involves interpolation. There's a well-known result called Craig's interpolation theorem stated here specifically for propositional logic, which says that if we have a propositional formula psi that entails a formula chi, then there is a, an intermediate formula i such that psi entails i, i in turn entails chi, and i only talks about the variables that are common to psi and chi. And this formula i is what we call an interpolant. Now, in model checking, it is more common to state this result in terms of a conjunction being unsatisfiable. And in this case, the interpolant is still entailed by psi, but then the second criterion is rephrased as i and chi is unsatisfiable. We already know that a variable y is defined by x if and only if this formula here is unsatisfiable. And we can now show that we can obtain a definition as an interpolant of this formula. So let's restate the properties of an interpolant and then let's choose as our psi here this part of the formula and as our chi this part of the formula. And then let's apply this first condition here which says that this part here implies the interpolant. We can rewrite this as just the formula itself implies that y implies the interpolant. And then from the second condition, we get this. So i and chi being unsatisfiable, we can rewrite as chi implies not i. And we can rewrite this as phi implies not y prime implies not i. And we can simply um, undo the renaming or just rename the y prime back to y and thus get rid of the primes here. And so we have both directions of this implication. And thus i, the interpolant, is a definition of y. And we can efficiently extract an interpolant from a resolution refutation of a formula. So if we have a satisfiability solver that traces proofs in a format that is roughly equivalent to propositional resolution, then not only can we check definability, but we can extract a definition from the proof of unsatisfiability. Now, let me briefly talk about an application of definition extraction in preprocessing quantified Boolean formulas. A for all exists QBF like that is true if and only if there is a function that maps every assignment of the universal variables to an assignment of the existential variables, such that for every assignment of the universal variables, the assignment combined with the assignment computed by the function satisfies the matrix. And this function is what we call a strategy. Now, it is sometimes convenient to think of a strategy not as an individual function, but as a collection, a family of functions, one for each existential variable. And then each of these individual functions maps an assignment of the universal variables to zero or one. And these functions we call strategy functions. We say that a variable has a unique strategy function if 
a particular function is part of every winning strategy, is the same for any winning strategy. That doesn't necessarily tell us that there is a winning strategy for the, say, existential player. But if there is one, then this function is part of it. So for instance, if we have a prefix where we have a subsequence for all x exists y, and then we have these two clauses that enforce equality, then clearly y has a unique strategy function that just corresponds to the value of x. So what we want to exploit here is the fact, more generally, that definitions in a propositional formula, definitions in the matrix here, are unique strategy functions. So if we have a, a, an existential variable here in this block, and it is defined in terms of all the universals preceding it, then it has a unique strategy function. And note that having a definition of y in terms of x1 up to xi is a sufficient condition for the variable having a unique strategy function, but it is not necessary. We implemented a tool that performs definition extraction to find unique strategy functions of quantified Boolean formulas using an interpolating version of Miniset that's part of the AV model checker. And because the individual definability queries are independent of each other, we can just run this tool for a while, and all the definitions that we, we can find up to that point we can use. So this is an anytime algorithm. And moreover, because we do not want the, the tool to spend too much time on any particular variable, we limit the number of conflicts for each SAT call, for each definability check, to a thousand. But this can be set in the tool. We performed experiments with this tool using the benchmark formulas from the 2018 QBF evaluation, and we wanted to answer two questions. First, how many variables are defined? How many unique strategy functions can we identify using this approach? And how does it affect the solvers? So what we tried to do was to take the definitions that we find, substitute them into the matrix. That gives us a non-CNF circuit QBF. As for the first question, a we circuit QBF solver and see universal variables how it performs. So we focused on existential variables. And then we computed for each instance the fraction of existential variables that are defined that there are unique strategy functions for. And we see histograms down here. So what's apparent is that for the two QBF benchmarks, there is a large number of instances that have 75% or more of their existential variables with unique strategy functions. And for general CNF QBFs, the situation is similar but somewhat less pronounced. We can break this down further into definitions that are found already by syntactic gate detection that were introduced by Zeitin conversion. So these are the, um, the turquoise bars here. So we see that there are many definitions that are found just by syntactic gate detection alone. And then after we remove uh, these definitions, the question is how many definitions remain that our tool can detect, that we can detect using our semantic gate detection technique and the histogram of the fraction of remaining variables that are uniquely defined uh, is then shown in the red bars. And we see that even though we, we get rid of many or we find many definitions just by syntactic gate detections, there, still, there is still a lot um, that is found even after syntactic gate detection. Let me briefly talk about the results for solving on the 2QBF benchmark set. 
On the one hand, we see a significant increase in the number of solved instances when using our tool compared to syntactic gate detection. And we actually get the best benefits from combining both. This applies to circuit solvers. For the CNF solver CADID, we actually see a decrease in the number of solved instances. And that is because for CADID, we have to encode the definitions as CNF and add them to the matrix. And that doesn't seem to be a very good way of giving these auxiliary definitions to CADID. Now, unfortunately, if we first apply standard preprocessing techniques, the beneficial um, effect of semantic gate detection disappears. So we can see that there's almost no difference between these three configurations. And while overall, for instance, there is a big increase in the number of solved instances for QABs, the best configurations for QFUN and GhostQ without preprocessing are significantly better than the best configurations of QFUN and GhostQ with preprocessing. It isn't entirely clear to me what's happening there. It appears that preprocessing destroys some of the structure that we can detect in the original instances and that is beneficial to solving. So let me summarize here. I presented a complete algorithm for extracting definitions from propositional logical formulas that uses SAT and interpolation. And I also showed an application in computing unique strategy functions of quantified Boolean formulas. The algorithm for that is an anytime algorithm. It is pretty fast and it finds unique strategy functions for a significant fraction of variables. So what I'd like to do on the implementation side is adapt the, the SAT solver a bit more to this particular application scenario and then perhaps parallelize the implementation. We also saw that the substitution of unique strategy functions into the matrix can be detrimental to solver performance. And here what I'd like to try is a tighter integration with the downstream solver. In particular, I think CAD might, might work very well if this is done the right way. And finally, I have some thoughts on how to turn this into a, a standalone QBF solver. So that's it for my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for the talk. So there is uh, already a question on the Slack a channel of your thread of your um, presentation. It's actually by Armin Bire asking whether you're building on top of uh, using the work of Ji Hong Zhang on extracting or synthesizing Boolean functions through interpolations. So that, that's very similar. I, um, when I first uh, Googled interpolation QBF or interpolation to QBF and came across the paper, I thought that's, uh, oh, uh, they, somebody already did that. Um, it is, um, so what they're doing is uh, limited to, let's say, a 2QBF prefix and also to deterministic relations in the sense that every, um, every variable has to be defined, then, then their approach works. Um, so this idea of doing this for individual um, variables uh, is not in that paper. Okay. Sorry um, about the amateurish editing, by the way. <laughs> what if you would go beyond the QBS? What if you would actually go as so bit vectors or? Oh, I, I haven't thought about this, um, but I think that that might work as well. I think then, I think you should also be able to do that for for SMT, but I, yes, I haven't, to be honest, I haven't thought about this in, in detail. Okay. 
think there are no more questions, at least there are unanswered questions on your Slack thread. But so maybe just one more follow-up. So if you would do go beyond like, like bounded arithmetic, then you would uh, still maintain the linear linearity is that, right? But you, so you could still, if you're saying that you can still extract, for instance, interpolants, that would be linear in the size of the proof, provided that the proof is a deck, right? Oh, okay. I'm not, I'm not really aware of these interpolation results for, for more general logics, I'm afraid. But yes, it's, uh, I mean, as long as you can get the inter interpolant and and then we we'll, we'll also have to look at the um, um, into Padua's theorem more more specifically when when this works. I think it's stated for first order logic, but then yeah, I'm I'm, I'm not completely sure how how the details will work. Okay, so let me close then your uh, presentation and thank thank you again for the uh, nice talk and for answering the questions. And then we can move further with the next talk on the session, which is going to be uh, given by Kuldeep Min, who's assistant professor at the National University of Singapore. And this is a joint work with Matthias Schorsch and Stefan Gott. And it's also a regular paper, so it's going to be a regular presentation. Please go ahead. Everyone, my name is Kuldeep Mail. I'm going to discuss our work on CNF XR solving and its applications to counting and sampling. This is joint work with Mathe Sus and Stefan Gost. So I'll get started with the core motivation of this work, which are the problems of counting and sampling. So in this context, we are set up Boolean variables, x1 to xn. We are given a CNF formula G as input over these variables. I'll introduce a little bit of notation here. So let's say all of these, the set of solutions of this formula. Now the problem of model counting is to determine the cardinality of the set of solutions of this formula. So which is to estimate the total number of solutions of G. The problem of sampling is to sample a solution sigma belonging to the set of solutions of G so that the probability sigma is output is one over total number of solutions of G. Over past decade, there has been a lot of effort in a design of hashing based techniques for counting and sampling. Let me give a quick overview of these techniques. So let the circle be the space of all possible assignments to G and the dots represent the satisfying assignments of G. If the number of solutions were small enough, then we could have just enumerated all the solutions and there you have your count. You could just randomly sample uh, a solution from the set of enumerated solutions. But typically we deal with cases where the number of solutions is very large so in such a case, the idea behind hashing based techniques is to partition the solution space into roughly equal small cells. By small, we mean a cell has a number of solutions less than some pre-computed threshold. In that case, now the idea is that we can go and pick a random cell. As I told you that they are small enough, so we'll be able to enumerate all the solutions and our estimate will be the total number of solutions in a cell multiplied by total number of cells. For sampling, once we enumerated all the solutions, we can just pick one of the uh, sample randomly. So as you can see, the core challenge these techniques had to address is that how to partition into roughly equal small cells of solutions without knowing the distribution of solutions. The key idea was to use pairwise independent hash functions. In particular, these techniques use what are called uh, random XORs. How do we construct these random XORs? Well, we pick a subset of variables randomly, we XOR them, and set that to zero or one randomly. Note that we have set of these XOR. So we could also view this in the its matrix representation. So we have mx equals to b, where m is a zero one matrix, x is the vector representing the set of variables, and b is another zero one vector. And all the operations here are our uh, mod two. So now, originally we had an input formula g, a cell can be represented by the conjunction of G with this uh, random XR that we have generated. And this is precisely the form of what we call a CNF XR formulas. So these formulas have CNF formula and a set of XRs. I have discussed how these formulas arise very crucially in context of counting and sampling, but these formulas uh, have wide variety of applications in particular such as cryptography. 
So once we have this formula F, well, for the techniques to work efficiently, we need to have access to a set solver that can handle this CNFX or formula efficiently. We know that if all we had to do was to deal with CNF formula, then we could have just use conflict-driven closed learning uh, techniques. Just to deal with XR formulas, you could just use Gauss-Jordan elimination. The challenge arises when you have a mixture of them. And essentially, essentially the bigger uh, bottleneck here is that just performing CDCL on XR formulas does not suffice because we know there are exponentially uh, lower bounds for uh, resolution-based techniques for XR uh, formulas. So the key idea is to essentially perform CDCL and Gauss-Jordan elimination in tandem. I will quickly give an overview of uh, the current state of art framework that we introduced in um, our, our work in 2019. This, and the uh, framework we call as BIRD, which essentially has four core steps. The first is BLAST. So in that case, we, set, we blast the set of XRs into CNF. Once we can blast, we can perform pre-processing or in-processing techniques because the entire formula is now in CNF, so these techniques can be performed uh, in CNF form. Uh, the important thing here to note is that the in-processing and pre-processing techniques are very much restricted to the CNF form. Once uh, we are done with pre-processing and in-processing, then we can recover the XORs from CNF. Now we can perform the CDCL on the CNF uh, formula, and we can uh, perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on this recovered XORs. And then we extend the unit and binary clauses. At some point, what turns out is that we will need to again perform in processing. And for that to do, we will have to essentially forget the XORs because the CNF part is going to uh, change due to these in processing techniques. So we destroy the XORs. We keep looping until we find uh, whether uh, we are able to show a set or unset. We were able to witness significant performance improvements over prior state of art, and the goal of this work is to pursue further improvement. I'm going to discuss two core improvements that we have proposed. Uh, rest of the improvements um, I would like to invite to read our paper in detail will be around for Q and A. So for the first improvement, let's focus on Gauss-Jordan elimination. Again, we have a matrix, mx equals to b. As you can see that m is usually undetermined. What do I mean by that? We have more columns than rows. So um, essentially there are lots of solutions of x here and there's no unique solution to x at this point. Um, that's kind of the typical case when you have more columns than the rows. So let's consider at some point in our search, here is the matrix that we have. And then we make a decision and we set x1 to 1. When we set x1 to 1, what we do is that we zero out the first column and we will have to, of course, make the appropriate change in B, uh, the column corresponding to B. Now, as you can see that if you look at the third row, then the only variable that is unassigned at this point is x5 and we can uh, deduce that we would be able to propagate x5 to 1. So how do we propagate? Well, now we'll also make the column corresponding to x5, uh, 0, and also uh, make an appropriate change in the column corresponding to b. And the set solver typically performs these uh, propagations uh, hundreds of thousands of times in its cycles, and it is very important that we have very efficient techniques that can perform these propagation conflicts uh, efficiently. Uh, at this point, it is worth uh, remarking that uh, one of the biggest improvement in uh, CDCL based set solvers was very efficient propagation technique proposed in the shaft paper. Okay, so what we uh, try to do is that, well, how can we uh, perform this propagation e efficiently enough? And the route that we took is, well, let's try to express all of these operations as close as possible to the assembly. And in particular, we uh, use uh, bit sets, which are bit arrays. We have two kinds of bit arrays in our case. One bit array uh, tries to record whether a column 
which is a, a particular variable is set or not. So you have a bit array corresponding to every variable and it records it is one if the corresponding variable uh, has been set. And another array um, uh, tries to record the value it has been set to. So uh, the entry in it makes sense only if the corresponding entry in A is true. And in that case, the another bit array B records the value uh, that the corresponding variable has been set to. So once we have these uh, two arrays A and B, and we have the original matrix, then we can compute these two quantities, which are a little bit complicated looking expression, but um, where we essentially compute the Hamming weight after taking the complement of A and doing a bitwise N with M of I. And then we compute the W well again with the similar operation. The key observation that we were able to make is that once we had these two quantities, to figure out whether the corresponding row is conflicting or propagating are essentially the checks where all we had to do is to check whether W uh, unassigned is zero or one and whether W well mod two uh, with an XR with B of I is zero or one. So the very important message I would like you to take home here is that all these operations are actually very efficiently uh, possible in the modern CPUs. So that allowed us uh, to get uh, all these operations to be really efficient uh, and they don't uh, typically take them uh, more than few cycles uh, for each corresponding row. So that this gives us a strong um, improvement rather than having to do the linear search, which is what uh, was being done uh, in the earlier state of art implementation that we had proposed earlier. Okay, so that uh, gets me to talk about the second part, which is that let's go back to the recovery uh, story about bud. So what we are doing, we start with the CNF formula. We would like to re uh, recover all the XY that are implied by CNF clauses. So in this case, as you can see here, we are able to deduce that uh, x1, xr, x2, xr, x3 equals to zero is implied by this set of xrs. Remember, it does not. I am. We are not claiming that both are equivalent. We only want to say that these xrs, uh, these CNF clauses, imply the corresponding xr. The key observation is that since Gauss order elimination is complete procedure, all the unit propagations will be discovered by the Gauss order elimination. So in that case, if a CNF clause is implied by the recovered XR, then it can be removed from its uh, the solving. So what we want to do is to figure out all the uh, clauses that are implied by the recovered XRs. And the very important aspect is that we would not be able to do this semantic check uh, clause by clause, and we would have to do it very efficiently. Unfortunately, due to lack of time, I would not be able to go in more details, but I would like to uh, highlight that we can we make a very nice, beautiful use of uh, Bloom filters, which allows us to do this check efficiently um, in almost about the linear time uh, for the entire uh, formula. So we kind of only make one pass to the entire formula, and that also without having to read the entire clauses because they store them in these Bloom filters. For rest of the technical details, I would like to invite you to our paper. So at this point, um, I discussed two uh, core contributions of this work. Of course, there are other three important uh, contributions about using the lazy uh, reason clause generation, reusing the solutions by the hashing techniques to uh, reduce the number of set calls, and also efficient extraction of partial solutions. So let's move into the experimental um, and we can put all of this together uh, into the framework that we call as BERT2, which is for uh, 2Ds at the end. So we blast, performing processing, recover, detach, uh, then perform CDCL and Gauss order elimination, and finally destroy and keep going through the loop. So let's move to the empirical evaluation. Remember our one of our motivation was in context of counting and sampling. So we took the state of our techniques for counting and sampling. And we, um, uh, so these techniques were currently implemented with BERT. And now uh, we incorporated BERT2 
So we take approximately three, we put together by two, we call it approximately four. And similarly in unit and two, we include by two and we call it unit and four. Uh, we had a time of uh, 5,000 seconds. We took the standard set of benchmarks uh, that have been used uh, in prior work. And here is how the results look like. So let me first discuss the results for counting. Uh, the plot that I'm showing is what is called cactus plot here. So on x-axis, we have the number of benchmarks sold. On y-axis, we have the time. Uh, what it indicates is that 1,100 benchmarks were sold in under 1,000 seconds. So ideally, we would like uh, the plot to be as uh, right uh, towards as right as possible. So as you can see, there is a significant gap between these two plots. Um, if uh, you are familiar with the typical uh, results in the set community, we don't typically see such a large gap by improving the underlying uh, core solvers. So this really shows the strength of our uh, improvements here. In particular, approximately three could solve 1148 instances, while we uh, have an uh, improvement of 77 instances, and we were able to solve 1225 instances. Now, moving on to sampling. Well, in case of sampling, uh, what we have is, again, a very similar story. Uh, I'm presenting the Cactus plot here, uh, the y, uh, time on y-axis, and the number of benchmarks sold on x-axis. And again, you can see a significant improvement over uh, uh, consistently for the number of benchmarks that are being sold, and also improvement in time. Again, we see an improvement of 51 instances. I think it is uh, worth emphasizing again, typically uh, in set community, we uh, see an improvement of 10 to uh, 20 benchmarks, so such an improvement uh, would be considered significant. Okay, so let me conclude now. So what uh, I did in the talk is we, uh, I discussed about CNFXR formula, and I mentioned how these formulas have wide ranging applications, although we focus on two important applications of counting and sampling. I discuss our new framework that we call as BERT2, where we do lazy, tainted, and detached CNFXR solving. I uh, spent some uh, time focusing on tainted and detached solving. And what we observe here is that there is a significant runtime improvement that shows the power of the tight integration between CNF and XR solving components. The two resulting tools are open source. We would um, like you to try them out and we would always be very happy to receive your feedback. With that, I will conclude the talk and I'll be happy to take any questions during Q&A session. Thank you very much for the nice talk and presentation. So I believe, uh, so there's a question by Aaron Biran asking, okay, so what about algebraic nonlinear in processing on the extractive equations or polynomials? So combining this with your Bosporus approach or, or is it only for cryptographic benchmark and not approximate counting? So, um, yeah, you know, going forward, we would certainly like to combine this with Bosphorus. Um, in case of counting and sampling, most we, are, we only get these random XORs. So I don't think uh, that would be really very useful when we are only looking at uh, counting and sampling. But uh, generally what it's building up towards is that Bosphorus is going to be integrated. It's almost integrated right now inside crypto mini set. So that's what we'll be looking at. Maybe so a question on, on basically on, on I think it was slide seven of your presentation and you had I mean the motivation was coming really from this Hemingway information flow applications. I mean you could use also your approach when uh, with all these XOR constraints on cryptanalysis and differential cryptanalysis. So were such some of your benchmarks coming from there? And if yes, then how did you make the pre-processing that you took the you know, the cryptanalysis benchmark or example, and you mapped it down to your subdomain. So uh, the experiments that we have presented in this paper, we only had the benchmarks coming from uh, counting and sampling. Um, and th those are the experiments that we have presented, but in other applications, because 
and this is something uh, implemented inside crypto miniset so in those cases uh, we do see improvements on the cryptographic instances so where you can recover the xrs and uh, after recovery you can perform gaussian elimination on top of that but the experiments that we had here were essentially the cnf formulas and we are interested in doing the counting or sampling over those and i don't think any of the cnf formulas uh, come from the crypt crypto analysis uh, benchmark suite there are, I am not aware of um, you know, very interesting applications for counting and sampling right now. Okay. Um, actually, Matthew replied that it's actually already there, but not fully working. So hopefully then it's going to be working and it's been compiled and performing good. Okay, so thank you very much for the very nice presentation. And then we would like to so let's move forward with the next talk and session, which is going to be a tool paper presented by Chao Huang, who is a postdoc fellow at Northwestern University. And the talk is going to be about a soft tool, which is a tool for safety analysis of weekly heart systems. Hi, I'm Chao Huang from Northwestern University. I'm very glad to introduce our tool, so for safety analysis of weekly heart systems on CAF 2020. This is a collaborated work with my colleagues in National Taiwan University and Northwestern University. In hard real-time systems, the deadline of sample to competition should be met for any step. It will cause overly conservative consumption on resources. Thus, weekly hard systems are proposed to tolerate bounded deadline misses, which is always described by the MK constraint. It will save more resources and provide more configuration flexibility. A natural question for weekly heart systems is the safety verification problem. That is, find a safe initial state set X0, such that from any initial state within such a set, the system will never leave the safe state set X. Our tool saw provides direct computation of the safe initial set by an easy to use interface. It can be also used for either offline analysis or online monitoring of the system state. Now the tool is available on GitHub. Please be free to play with it. The basic idea of our tool is to find X0 satisfying both local safety and inductiveness. Local safety here means that starting from any state within X0, the system will not go out of the safe region within K steps. The inductiveness here means that starting from any state within the X0, the system will go back to X0 after K steps. To find such a set X0, I will to first do the partition. It partitions the safe region into grids, and then based on the reachability relation, we construct a graph considering all the cases of the deadline miss and deadline meet under MK constraint. Then we use the graph theory to solve the problem and compute the safe initial set. This is the structure of our tool. We can see that there are three key components, one step graph constructor, local safety gamma S and K step graph GK constructor, in inductiveness set calculator. We will introduce them one by one. First, we need to construct one step reachability graph. For each grid, for example, D5, we compute its reachable set with respect to deadline mid and deadline miss. In the case of deadline mid, we can see its reachable set overlaps V1, V2, and V3. Then V1, V2, and V3 will be considered as successors of V5 with respect to deadline mid. Thus, we add an edges from V5 to V1, V2, V3 respectively with level one. Note that when the reachable set overlaps the unsafe region, we let the successor set be empty. For example, in the case of deadline miss here, 
we let the successor set of v5 be empty. After we obtain a one-step reachability graph, we can search the grid set for local safety. In this component, we need to solve the graph problem. That is, find a node set gamma s. We are starting from any node in gamma s. The node that any k-step path satisfying mk constraint goes through has both zero and one out edges. Here, we use a dynamic programming approach to solve this problem. Meanwhile, we will obtain GK, the k-step reachability graph as a byproduct. In final step, based on the k-step reachability graph we obtained in last component, we search the reset for inductiveness, which is a subset of gamma s. In this component, we solve the graphic problem. Find a no set gamma i, while gamma i constructs the largest closed subgraph of gamma s with the edges of the k-step graph. In this example, v2, v3, v6 constructs gamma i. Here, we use an inverse searching algorithm to find the, the set for inductiveness, gamma i. We use a simple example to illustrate how to use our tool. This is a linear control system. We give its dynamics and a sampling period and a safe set and a given initial set. We first prepare the modifier, which includes all the necessary information. Then we can run the command. Then our tool will report the verification information, including the information of the graph we construct and the verification result. In this example, we can see that our tool successfully computes the safe initial region and proves that the system is safe under the given initial set with the MK constraint 2.5. Our tool also provides visualization result. In this figure, we can see that the green solid area is the safe initial set our tool computes, and the blue region is the given initial set. We can see that the given uh, initial set is a subset of the safe initial region our tool computes, so the system is safe. Thanks for attention. If you have any questions, please be free to email me. Thanks. Thank you for the presentation. So, when I'm checking the questions on the, I mean, the not, not yet existing questions on your on your presentation, uh, let me ask something. I, I, so, on your algorithms, so basically you calculate the inductiveness of your by computing this grid set. Yes. Uh, so, when you report this grid set, then how can what is the inductiveness argument from there? So. Uh, from, how can one just come up with an inductiveness argument as being a formal answer to your input problem? Um, if I understand correctly, do you mean that, do you want to know the definition of the inductiveness? Yes. No, 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 no. So, I'm, so how to interpret the result of your, uh, so you compute this grid set, right? And then what does it tell you for your input problem? So how can you, ensure, so how do you ex extract that it's an actual inductive? Um, okay, so with the, the definition of the inductiveness and the local uh, safety, we know that the system will be safe uh, within the k-sampling period, right? So because the system is safe uh, under uh, within k uh, steps because of the local safety, and we know that the system will go back to the initial set under k steps uh, due to the uh, inductiveness. So uh, during the next k-sampling period, the system will uh, behaviors uh, the behavior of the system will uh, look similar to the behavior in the first case sampling period. So that's why, so based on this, uh, so the system will do it like a theoretically. So we can prove the system theoretically by these two definitions. 
So that's why we introduced these two concepts. And with the help of these two concepts, we can prove the safety, the infinite time safety of the system. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so when we show this example from the linear control um, problem, yes. so um, have you considered other benchmark? Maybe let's say from, from CPS benchmark, like where we have quite many control theory examples to use your tool on that or? Uh, actually, we can handle the, the, the nonlinear system. Also, we can handle the neural network control system, which is ongoing work, and we will uh, release it very soon. So for more uh, complicated cyber-physical system like autonomous vehicle, which includes the perception module, uh, the planning module, and the control module. So, um, so we are also working on that, but it takes more time because it's much more complicated than simple closed-loop close classical control system. So yeah, that's our plan and you will see the most uh, the newest version which can handle the new network control system very soon. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. You're so, welcome. Uh, thanks for answering. So we can then move further with the last talk of the session, which is also a tool paper given by Karen Chow on, CQA, on a scalable tool for semi-quantitative analysis of chemi chemical reaction networks. Hello. My name is Kelvin Chow, and now I'm going to talk about Sequoia, a scalable tool for semi-quantitative analysis of chemical reaction networks. First of all, chemical reaction networks are high-level and versatile language for modeling and analysis of biochemical systems. The semantics is given by continuous time Markov chains, whose states are vectors of naturals, capturing the population of each species. The analysis of chemical reaction networks poses different challenges including probabilistic behavior of the system, the size of the systems, so potentially state space explosion, or stiffness, meaning the great differences between the rates of the system. To deal with these challenges, our tool implements the semi-quantitative abstraction and analysis proposed at CUF19. The technique consists of two main steps. The abstraction, yielding small models easy to analyze, and the analysis, focusing on the most probable behavior and iteratively exploring less probable behavior. Now the two main ideas of our abstraction are considering population intervals instead of concrete population numbers and the acceleration of transitions. Here you can see a classic abstraction on the left and our abstraction on the right. The transition or reaction P increases the population number of the species in the second vector component from the interval 1 to 20 to the interval 21 to 50. As you can see in the classic abstraction, you would need to follow a chain of reactions leading to the same state before the population is actually increased. However, it is not even clear whether the population is increased eventually. So instead we add a new transition capturing these reaction chains leading to a different population level. The rates of these accelerated transitions then capture the mean time required for the chain of reactions to happen. Further, they also consider competitive reactions. In this example, the newly added transition in the right abstraction is labeled with AP, standing for the acceleration of P. We then remove the problematic self-loops and obtain a system that contains significantly less non-determinism. Hence, it is easier to conclude on properties of the system in our abstraction. The main idea of the analysis is then to analyze the most probable behaviors in our model. By implementing the previously proposed technique, our tool features scalability. Because our abstraction is small, we can analyze complex chemical reaction networks within seconds, while existing numerical and simulation techniques require minutes or hours. Robustness, because our tool does not need precise rates, and our tool computes interpretable and explainable results, providing a small abstraction with its decomposition into different iterations. Moreover, our tool introduces a more flexible and precise analysis compared to the CUF-19 theory paper, allowing to also consider less probable behaviors. Mean simulations, a useful tool to capture typical behaviors of the system, and automated visualization, aiding the analysis process. Now let's have a look at a case study, namely the gene expression model. Here you can see the reactions of the network. We have four species in this network, protein, denoted by P, RNA, DNA on, and DNA off. Biologists are interested in the oscillation 
between two states in the steady state with DNA on and DNA off, the correlation between high amounts of RNA and DNA on and the correlation between no RNA and DNA off. These hypotheses can now be confirmed with our tool. For this purpose we first visualize the whole abstraction and colorize the steady state distribution. We can observe that the states are discovered in different iterations, since our tool automatically groups them together. The distribution is reflected by the colorization of the state. The more red, the higher the probability of the state in the distribution. We can see that most of the states which are colored in red are discovered in iteration 1. Thus we can prune our abstraction by only considering states discovered within iteration 1. Now we have already obtained an interpretable and explainable model, but we can further simplify the model by considering a more compact representation. In the left abstraction we can group states belonging to the same strongly connected component together and collapse them, and then we obtain the representation on the right. The states in this representation represent several states. Because the resulting model is small, we can easily see the oscillation between the two abstract states in the steady state distribution with DNA on and DNA off. The abstract state colored in red at the top represents the states with DNA on and the abstract state colored in red at the bottom represents the states with DNA off. We can easily see that the graph contains a cycle, here colored in orange. Thus we can conclude on the oscillation. Now we can also have a look at the correlation. On the left you can see the steady state distribution colored in red as before and on the right the correlation high RNA and DNA on and no RNA DNA off colored in blue. As you can see the correlation captured in blue perfectly aligns with the steady state distribution. And we see that the states satisfying the correlation are indeed the states the system spends most of its time in. Hence we can conclude on the correlation as well. Another useful feature of our tool are mean simulations. Our abstraction has operational semantics and thus we can run a simulation on our abstraction. Note that our mean simulations are not an average computed over a set of simulations, but rather reflect mean patterns. The mean simulations capture the typical behaviors of the system. Here you can see the trajectory of our mean simulation on the left compared with a simulation obtained with the DSD tool on the right. As you can see, there is a clear resemblance. Now let me conclude. Sequoia implements the previously proposed semi-quantitative abstraction and analysis, offers automated visualization, is scalable and robust, and allows for a flexible and precise analysis. Moreover, it introduces the useful mean simulations. Although experimentally our tool returns analysis corresponding closely to that of other tools, the formal error bounds are still a matter of future work as well as providing more case studies. The tool is available under sequoia.model.in.toom.de. We invite you to download and try out the tool for yourself and will be happy to assist in case of any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the presentation. So we so far, there are no questions yet on the on the Slack. Yes. So what I mean about robustness, like, so what actually you mean? How many? So where is the how big your case studies have been? So as was, you mentioned two in your talk, but on which? Yes. Level? So, so they had a handful of reactions, and with robustness, we mean uh, robustness with uh, respect to the concrete rates, as they are often also unknown. Uh, it's quite important and um, our tool does not work with precise rates, only with uh, orders of magnitudes. And then by the mean simulations, if I'm not familiar with the terminology, do you mean by simulation on the expected values on the mean or no? Or something else? Uh, we, we mean simulation on, uh, on our abstraction. So because it has operational semantics, we can also run a simulation on it. Um, and the important thing is that it's not uh, averages over simulations, but um, rather reflects the typical behaviors of the system. So you mean that you, you observe the operational semantics and then you mean, so the mean is about the... No, I, I mean that our, our abstraction has operational semantics. And this is the reasoning why we can 
actually run such a simulation on our abstraction. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Okay. Thank you again for the presentation. I see no yeah. questions yet. Thank you very much. Uh, but please join uh, the breakout uh, session of CAP because people might ask and continue the, um, on the discussion on the all talks that have been presented in today's um, session, Tracy. So with that, I would actually conclude this session of CAP and please join the breakout room.